Lift up the word and repeat after me. I believe this is the word of God. I believe what God says because it is impossible for God to lie. Well, I'm going to talk to you about something today that may seem a little different. Of course, it seems like everything I talk to you about is a little different. But today I'd like to talk to you about ghosts and the occult. I said ghosts and the occult. We're, we're nearing this time of the year when there's a lot of emphasis on demonic spirits, the devil, scary things. And somehow it has crept into our society to where it's becoming accepted. A few years ago, Loretta and I, we were traveling through Arkansas, and it was late, and we just, I was, I was so tired, I just couldn't drive anymore, so we looked around, and there was this big old hotel over there, big, uh, stately looking place, and so we pulled in to see if they had any rooms, and they did, so we, we got a room, and we got into our room, and it was kind of an old style, Victorian type room, and, uh, but I, I, could hear this commotion going on out in the hallway. And so, you know me, I always kind of like to see what's going on. So I went out into the hallway and there was a film crew out there uh, with professional film crews and, and people that looked like they were announcers and reporters. And what it was is they were from the sci-fi channel and they were investigating the most haunted hotels in America. And what we didn't know that in the, in the room across the hall from us, about a hundred years before, a whole bunch of people, 30 or 40 people, had died mysteriously because that building that was now a hotel used to be an insane asylum. <laughs> and so Loretta says, what's going on out there? I said, nothing. Just nothing. Kind of reminded me of Lester Summerall one time. He was, he was in bed <clears throat> and he's <clears throat> his bed started shaking. And so he, he woke up, and when he woke up, he saw this demonic spirit standing at the end of his bed. And he says, oh, it's just you. He rolls over and went back to sleep. You know, we as Christians should know our authority to where the enemy does not scare us. So they, inve they investigated. I never did get to see the documentary on television, but... but uh, I found out later that they had ghost tours at that hotel and that you could actually sign up with the travel agency and take a tour and they pretty well guaranteed that you would see a ghost. Now you've all heard me talk about UFOs, UAPs and all that kind of stuff in the past. And we came up with this that the people actually are seeing something. Now, when it comes to ghosts, people are actually seeing something. The question is, what are they seeing? Now, what is a ghost by today's terminology? By today's terminology, here's what uh, a ghost is. A ghost is an embedded spirit that is considered to be a disembodied spirit that is visible, has a transparent image, and it looks like a human who has lived in the past and has died, but somehow is restricted to this earthly plane to complete a task or to communicate with someone. Now, <clears throat> in today's society, you look it up in an encyclopedia dictionary, whatever, Google it. If you ask what is a ghost, you'll get a, a definition similar to that. But what is it really? How do we as Christians deal with this? Now, ghost theorists people who believe in ghosts, 
who are Christians use the Bible, and what they'll use is Matthew 14, 16, as proof that ghosts exist. And let's just take a look at that scripture. Matthew 14, well, let's take a look at this, verse 25. Now, in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. This is the story about Jesus walking on the water. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, be of good cheer, it is I. Don't be afraid. Do not be afraid. Now here's, here's what, where they go with this. They say, if ghosts didn't exist, then Jesus would have said, you thought I was a ghost? No, ghosts don't exist. But he didn't say ghosts don't exist. He just told them not to be afraid of what they saw. However, here's what we need to understand. In the original Greek, the word for ghost is pneuma, which is actually, let's just have a little Greek lesson here. If we could put up the graphic of pneuma. Okay, pi, nu, epsilon, epsilon, mu, alpha. You got the word pneuma there. It means, it's parallel to the Old Testament word of breath, but it means ghost. If you're translating the Bible back in the 1600s, it means ghost. But the word actually, in its clearest form, means spirit. This is why some of your Bibles will say, Holy Ghost. Talking about the third member of the, the Godhead, or the, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Some of your Bibles will say, Holy Spirit. Why do some say Holy Spirit? Some say Holy Ghost. I had a man approach me a few months ago, and he said, You're teaching heresy. And I said, Whoa. What is it that I'm teaching? He says, you keep talking about the Holy Spirit. He's not the Holy Spirit. Look in the Bible. He's the Holy Ghost. Well, ghost and spirit are the same word. So when, what the disciples actually said was, we thought you were a spirit. Well, why would they think he was a spirit? That's because spirits can be seen. Now, we must understand this also, that angels are spirits. And if people are seeing something, seeing an apparition, what is it they're seeing? Well, they're seeing, probably, most likely, they're seeing a spirit. Now, how do you know if it's a good spirit, if it's a, a fallen angel, that is perverted and now a devil, how do you know that? Or how do you know if it's of God? Maybe it's an angelic being that's in a certain form. How do you know? Or how do you know that it's not a disembodied spirit? How do you know it's not your Uncle Harry who has come back to torment you because you wrecked his car? And he's going to torment you? No. Well, let, let me just put this to rest right now. There is nowhere in the Scripture where it says that a person comes back from the dead in a spirit disembodied ghostly form the way ghosts are defined today. So, what, what does this mean? Well, it means that if you go to a seance and there is a person there who is channeling a spirit and they're telling you it's your Uncle Harry and your, your, or your mother or your spouse who's gone on and your heart is hurting so bad that you you just want to talk to them one last time. You want to tell them you love them just one more time. And so you meet a friend who tells you that you can go to a, a seance, a person, a medium, who can let you talk to that person. 
So you show up. And then the person who is the medium, who is the, the one who is channeling, goes into some kind of uh, one of two things. It's either trickery or it's demonic. Sometimes it's just strictly tricks. It's just somebody doing sleight of hand. Somebody who has researched. But sometimes it's demonic. And so you're setting it at this place and all of a sudden this person's channeling and they're saying, this is uncle, your uncle Harry. And you wrecked my car. And you're sitting over there and you're going, well, yeah, but everybody knows that. I mean, everybody knows I wrecked a car. But when you wrecked it, you stole a $5 bill out of my glove box. And you think to yourself, whoa, this must be Uncle Harry. Because nobody knew. Nobody knew I took that $5 bill out of the glove box. I never told anybody. So it must be real. Well, let me tell you about familiar spirits. There are demonic spirits that are assigned to people. And they will follow you sometimes for years. And they never sleep. They, they know every little detail about you. And so the demonic spirit then tells something that it has observed that nobody knows in order to lull you into believing that this person you're talking to is your Uncle Harry or your spouse or your child or whoever so that you will continue getting deeper into this interaction and eventually... Now listen, eventually you'll be swallowed up by the occult. But that is, that is just the door opener. It's just like with drugs. There's some soft drugs a person can take. And then you get into a little harder drugs. The next thing you know, you're an addict. You think, well, how did it start? Well, it's just like the guy that wrote me from... Uh, he was on death row, and he was... In a, actually, he was in a cell next to a very famous um, serial killer. And he wrote me a letter, and, uh, and he was talking about how he got into mutilation and, and torture and how he raped and killed people. And he was on death row. He was sentenced to death, and, and he actually did get executed down in Florida. But um, he told me that it all started with soft porn he started out with soft porn and then then he would graduate and he became a voyeur and a peeping tom and and i mean he told me all kinds of weird stories but they progressed and then as he leveled off in this progression he needed to go farther and farther and deeper and deeper and next thing you know he wasn't satisfied until he raped and mutilated someone That's the way the occult is. And we have to, as the church, we have to be watchful of these little things that are of the occult and not accept them into the church. Not bring them into the sanctuary of God. So, one thing to understand is uh, anything that is grotesque, that is scary, that is bizarre in a negative way, it's not God. Now, we do have discerning of spirits. Thank God we have discerning of spirits as something that Christians have available. The world doesn't have this available. If, if you're not a believer, you don't have discerning of spirits as described in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. You don't have that available. And so the world just gobbles this stuff up. I mean... Turn on your television, look in a magazine, you'll find movie stars right and left. They're all trying to channel people and, and talk to the dead. You can't do that. The Bible says it's not a good thing. I mean, granted, if you see an angel of God, you could be startled. Remember the, the shepherds, the angels came to proclaim the birth of Jesus. And the, 
the, the angels had to tell the shepherds, don't be afraid. <laughs> but those angels praised God. They didn't, they didn't torture. They didn't mutilate. They didn't become a skeleton and, and get all weird. Coming into this time of the year, we got to watch that the church doesn't get sucked into this. Hmm. And it's so easy. Uh, yeah. You know, in the early days of, of my Christian walk, I, uh, Loretta and I joined this church, and I was fresh out of college. I had a degree in theology. I had major in theology. And, and so this church asked me to be the brotherhood director. Uh, you know, over all the men, we, every Saturday we had, it was here at the Lake of the Ozarks, it was a denominational church, and every Saturday we had a men's breakfast, and the president of the men's group was in charge, and they had asked me. And I thought it was because of my vast theological knowledge. You know, I was just in my 20s. What I found out later is they'd ask every man in that church, and they'd all turned it down. And I was their last hope, you know, like, Obi-Wan, you're my last hope. But I was feeling pretty good about it, and I was really seeking more of God. And at that time in my life, uh, I, I just was wondering, where, where is God? What? I mean, I'm a Christian, I'm a believer, I, I know I'm called into the ministry, but there's got to be more than this. And so I thought maybe by teaching a little devotional on Saturday morning to the men, this, this, this is kind of like a little rabbit trail, but I'll, I've got to tell this, and I, I told it a few weeks ago. Uh, after one of my devotions, I thought I had done pretty good, and I'm standing outside the church getting ready to get in my car, and I saw three of the older men standing on the sidewalk, and you know how you can tell when somebody's looking at you? And I could tell they were looking at me, and I knew what they were thinking. They were thinking, boy, that was a good devotion today. Boy, that Larry, he sure gave a good devotion. So they finally came over to me, and I was waiting to hear the compliment. And they said, you know, we were just talking about you. I go, yeah, I know. I could tell. They said, you know, we've decided this church is 110 years old. And we've all gone here all of our lives, and, you know, we're older. And Brother Wilcox, his daddy before him. And we just decided something this morning. Of all the brotherhood directors that we've ever had at this church, you make the best gravy of any of them. Because that was my job, to make the gravy. Oh, man. I mean, at, so I got in my car, and I was, I was so thankful that the window wasn't down on the passenger side, because I took my Bible, and I threw it across and hit the window. And I, I remember saying, God, if this is all there is, if I'm just going to be a, a gravy maker. So, well, but at any rate, that was, a, that was a rabbit trail. But here's the true story. Because of my position, they put me on the church planning committee. And I went to one planning meeting. And in that planning meeting, they were going to decide what they were going to do for the youth for Halloween. And so it consisted of me, the ladies' director, the men's director, the pastor's wife, the chairman of the deacons. We're all sitting around this table in the parsonage. And so every idea that came up about what to do for the youth, the pastor's wife would say, oh, that won't, that won't be good enough. Last year was so good, we can't top last year. Well, I was new. So I finally, I said, well, what did we do last year? And she reached over, put her, I never will forget, she put her hand on my arm and she said, oh, last year was so wonderful. We, we brought a big round table down to the basement of the parsonage, covered it with a white cloth, put candles on it, turned down the lights, and we had a seance. Well, that was my last meeting. But it's kind of like, what, what are we doing? Are we inviting the devil to church? I mean, come on, church. We don't do that in the church. Well, I couldn't believe my ears. But, you know, 2 Corinthians 11.14 says that Satan himself disguises himself as an angel of light. So that just means that sometimes things that are really evil can look really good. See, apparently Christians now 
see nothing wrong with demonic Halloween parties in the church and allowing children to dress like witches and goblins and demons. Oh boy, you're messing up my holiday. No, no. I'm just telling you, we don't do this in the church. This church is 30 years old. We don't, we've never dressed up like, we've never taken our kids and dressed them up like devils. Hmm. Has the modern church become so humanistic that this is just acceptable? Hmm. Well, we have something that the world doesn't have. We've got that discerning of spirits. Let me tell you what it says here. 1 Corinthians 14, 39. Therefore, brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy and do not forbid to speak in tongues and let all things be done decently and in order. Do you think bringing the devil to church is a decent and in order thing to do? No. 1 Corinthians 14, 32. And the spirits of the prophet are subject to the prophet. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. God's not the author of confusion. It's confusing to children when you bring them to church and dress them like a devil. Cricket. Cricket. Okay. Can a person return from the grave and give a message? Well, I just know that that was Uncle Harry. And he's after me for that $5 that I stole out of his glove box. You know. Jesus talked about the rich man and Lazarus. That was an actual event. That wasn't a parable. <clears throat> Listen to what he said in Luke 16, 26. And besides this, between us and you, he's talking about between Hades and the bosom of Abraham, there is a gulf fixed so that no one, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. In other words, you can't go back and forth. You're stuck where you are. If you're in paradise, if you're in the bosom of Abraham, you're being comforted. And you're stuck there in that comfort. <clears throat> if you're in Hades, you're stuck in the torment and you can't leave. <clears throat> Now, listen, the rich man tried to negotiate. Listen to what he said. Then he said, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. The man who was in Hades was saying, send Lazarus back so that he can talk to my brothers, because my brothers are messed up, and I don't want them coming here. Send him back. And Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if one goes from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, The one rise from the dead. In other words, you can take all of that in context and balance it out. And he's saying, you can't do it. Can't be done. Now, a familiar spirit. Somebody may say, well, but Saul, remember he? He tried to go to a witch, and, but it was so that somebody could come back, and, and the Bible kind of recounts that spirit coming back. Listen to this. To conjure up the dead, or to even attempt to speak to the dead, is strictly forbidden in the Bible. Strictly forbidden. And you're not speaking to the dead person anyway. You're speaking to a familiar demonic spirit. And that will not get you points with God. Or it will not give you any true answers. Listen, listen. Paul attempted, or excuse me, Paul. Saul attempted this. Saul, King Saul in the Old Testament. Listen to this in Chronicles 10, 13. So Saul died for his unfaithfulness, which he committed 
against the Lord because he did not keep the word of the Lord and also because he consulted a medium for guidance. One of the stupidest things you can do is go to your horoscope and try to get guidance or go to a Ouija board or go to a medium or someone who says, I, uh, I can contact people on the other side. Hmm. Well, remember this. God said, Malachi 3.6, He said, I'm the Lord. I don't change. I don't change. Hebrews 13.8, Jesus said, I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. And He says, He told His disciples, He said, look at me. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father, because the Father and I are one. Let me tell you something about the Father and about Jesus. What they did not like 5,000 years ago, they didn't like it 2,000 years ago. And I don't care what the Supreme Court says, they don't like it now. They haven't changed. What they liked then, they like now. What they hated then, they hate now. What was an abomination then has not changed. It's an abomination now. So the church has got to get its act together and quit dabbling in the occult. Hmm. Now, listen to this. What does the Bible say about contacting spirits? Leviticus 19.31. Remember, God doesn't change. Give no regard to mediums and familiar spirits. See, there's that familiar spirits thing again. What is a familiar spirit? Well, you can check it out. It's a spirit that is familiar with you or familiar with someone you know that's passed on and can tell you things that probably the person who's passed on may not even have remembered. Okay? Give no regard to mediums or familiar spirits. Do not seek after them to be defiled by them. You mess with them, you get defiled. I am the Lord your God. <laughs> Hello? Do we need another verse? I'm going to give you one anyway. Okay. Leviticus 20, verse 6. And the person who turns to mediums and familiar spirits to prostitute himself with them. Now what does that mean? That means you're committing spiritual adultery. To prostitute himself with them, I will set my face against that person and cut him off from his people. Do you want God to set his face against you? Do you think, how many of you think that's a real good idea? No, it's not. To become obsessed with ghosts and the paranormal, it doesn't mean that you can't know about them. The Bible tells us about them. I read scriptures about them. We need to have this knowledge. Hosea 4.6 says, my people perish for a lack of knowledge. Sometimes we don't understand what God's been trying to tell us. We need to know about them, but we don't need to know about them by being involved with them. Well, kind of reminds me of the time we were having a testimony meeting at church, and, and uh, I can say this because they're no longer here, but uh, on the earth, they're not here. <laughs> uh, we had someone say, I, we got a testimony, we got a family out of town, and, and they're all druggies, you know, they spend half the night smoking marijuana, weed, and and boy, they're, and taking all kinds of stuff. And so we went to visit them to get them saved. So we, we got into a little weed and a few things. And by three o'clock in the morning, we were all real high. We got them saved. Well, I don't know if they got them saved or not. But I will tell you this. <laughs> You don't have to go to the whorehouse to witness to the prostitute. Was that too bold?
Hmm. <laughs> you do know I get in trouble for being bold sometimes. <laughs> and I don't care. <laughs> All right. All right. Now, John 16, 13. So here, here's the deal. You got these little kids, they come up to your door, and they're all dressed up as whatever, and they're sweet little kids. Jesus, you know, John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world, but John 3.17 says He didn't come into the world to condemn the world. And we are not to be condemners. Don't, now all of a sudden, don't become the occult police. You know, you're walking down the hall at aisle at Walmart, and some kid walks by with a demonic suit on, and you go... I rebuke you in the... No, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't, don't be that person. How, how, do, how do we win the world? With love and by them seeing how we conduct ourselves. We're not going to condemn other churches that have Halloween parties. We're just not going to have Halloween parties. Now, kids like to dress up. Okay, that's fine. Let them dress up like some character or whatever. You know, Robbie used to dress up like Superman. He, he had blue pajamas and he had red underwear. And what he would do is he'd put on his pajamas and he'd put his underwear on over... He was young at the time. <laughs> this is not when he was associate pastor of the church. Okay. <laughs> but he, he had his blue pajamas and then he'd put his red underwear on and tie a towel around his neck and jump off the building. You know, think he's Superman. Well, you know, those the kids. You, but I'll tell you what. We didn't let him dress up like the devil. Red mask and horns and a tail. and You know what? Do you understand? There's a difference between children just dressing up. Kids love to dress up. Let them dress up. We can have a dress-up party at the church. You know, what, what does the Bible say about this? Oh, let me. Oh, I got a good verse over here. I think I skipped it. Ah, no, it's over. It's, I'm still going here. Just a second. Ah, right here. 3 John 11. Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. 3 John 11. Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good? He who does good is of God. He who does evil has not seen God. What does that say? Don't imitate evil. You want to imitate something, imitate good. Have the kids all dress up as their favorite Bible character. Have them all. <laughs> I never will forget one little guy came out one day and he just had a suit and tie on. And I said, what Bible character are you dressed up? He says, you. <laughs> this is true. Ah, Ephesians 5.1, Jim McDermott's favorite verse. Therefore, be imitators of God. If, we're, if you're going to imitate something, imitate, emulate good things. You know, have a, have a Christmas play and the kids are dressed as shepherds and angels and let them dress up. It, it's fine. The kids love it. But let's just don't dress them up like evil beings. What are, what are we training them to? that it's okay to dabble with it, a Ouija board or whatever. Okay, if you want the truth, where do you go? John 16, 13. However, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. For He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak. And He, the Holy Spirit, now listen to this. This is John 16, 13. He will tell you things to come. You say, well, I, I, I contact the occult because I want to have a heads up on what's going on. I need to know what to do. Hey, you want to find out what to do? Get with the Holy Spirit and He will show you things to come. You worship God, God will guide you. Isaiah 48, 17. Let's see if that's the right scripture. Pull up for <laughs> Isaiah 48, 17. Do we have that in our Bible? Is there such a verse? Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord your God who teaches you to profit. Listen to this. Who leads you by the way you should go. 
If you want guidance, here's where you get your guidance. You get it from the Lord. You get it from the Holy Spirit. Wow. A Christian should never seek the kingdom of darkness for answers. We have discerning of spirits available. <laughs> I don't know if this next statement that I wrote down is true or not. We have common sense. I'm just going to say, most of us have common sense. You know what? Common sense just basically says, don't mess with the devil. Come on. All right. Parting thought. This, this is my last thought here. Almost. James 4, 7 says, Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now, here's, here's my, my thought. You cannot submit to the devil and expect him to flee. You can't do that. Loretta and I were asked to uh, be a part of the Halloween celebration at the Hurricane Deck School. You remember that? And so we were, going, we were supposed to dress up like something. I'll tell you what, I had fun. I got me a long black coat, long, went down to the, to the ground, long black coat. I got a priest's collar. I got a priest's hat. And I got a big, long, purple scarf. And I got the biggest Bible I could find. And this is true. Loretta will verify this. We got to the school. They opened up the doors, and I stood there, and there was a street light behind me. It looked like the Exorcist movie. I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm standing there, you know, and there's just enough breeze that that scarf was flowing, and I had that. You know, <laughs> and the lady who opened the door was dressed like a witch. It's a true story. And Loretta's a witness of this. She was dressed like a witch, and she opened the door and started to do her witchy thing. And she saw me, and she starts screaming and huddled up over in the corner and couldn't move. <laughs> True story. She's screaming over in the corner at the school. You want to dress up? Dress up like a man of God. And demons don't like that. They don't like that. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you all the glory. We give you the praise. We give you the honor. And Father, we submit to you and only you. And we do not, as individuals or as a church, or as a body of believers, we do not submit to evil spirits or the devil. And we thank you, Father, that you've given us your word. You've given us authority over all the power of the enemy. And you told us in Luke 10, 19, that nothing shall by any means harm us because of that authority when we take it. In the name of Jesus, amen.